As Tissa uh, introduced me, we're here today to chat a bit uh, about um, uh, MLflow and uh, how it works. Uh, this particular talk is introductory and it's related with a book that I published recently around uh, machine learning engineering with MLflow. Uh, like it's an introductory book to MLflow and the different components of MLflow and how would you use like MLflow to solve uh, some of the machine learning engineering problems. But uh, there's a lot of personal uh, taste and take on a lot of the things that I'll be discussing. So I'll ignore the basic uh, things that you would find online on uh, on, your, um, on your documentation and things like that. And I'll focus on things that I think are interesting about uh, flow in particular. Now we act like machine learning engineering. Uh, yeah, cool. So I'll run around about like some uh, Ember modules and go through the process to different stages of machine learning engineering productionization and how ML flow can aid on, on these components. And then we can have a QA in the end. It'll be approximately 25 minutes, so 20 to 25 minutes, depending on how it goes. And yeah, let's get started. Uh, so a typical simplified ML uh, project process is ideation, like you come with a business idea, like uh, from like potentially a product manager. And uh, from there, like this idea is sent to data scientists or data analysts, prototyping, uh, and you pilot if it makes sense. And if it, if it's a, like, if it's a, a, a kind of like model or solution that will just uh, bring value to the business, it goes into production. So this is like the, let's say, uh, hypothetical process, but we know that like these things do change and things do move around. So this is the ideal scenario. So what I'll try to do is uh, like just uh, address some of the vert or some of the components of each of these blocks. And uh, I want to show you guys how ML flow can help on each of the components and whatever I don't address, I might have opinions and we can chat in the end. Okay, cool. Uh, so, so obviously the first part is like ideation and problem framing and things like that. Many techniques to this, like the most famous one is the one uh, at, by Google, like problem framing technique. So I'll just simplify the sample project that I'll use here. So we're trying, we have like a set of floats and we are like trying to clarify in the end a, a number. So a lot of the examples are based on the same problem and there's a, like a toy data set that we will be uh, you know, talking about and it's a binary classification problem. And I will try to explore it, like different sides of the problem and with MLflow. So ML engineering in general, this should have had a sort, but um, so it's basically like it varies company by company. Each company call engineering or like one type of set of skills, but in general is related either with data that goes into models or models that go into production. And basically it's a mix of skills as you all know, because we have talked a lot on the on this meetup about data engineering. So it's a mix of data science, data engineering, DevOps, backend engineering, and data analytics. And there are many tools. So MLflow has, has been gaining momentum in the last few years. Like let's say the first time that I heard about that was more or less three years ago. And I gave like a meetup, I think it was end of 2018 when <laughs> MLflow was in version 0 0.1. And to some of the people here, like was on this, on, on some of the talks that I did, at one at my previous company. So MLflow at that time was like a completely different beast than what is today. So um, <clears throat> this is directly from the MLflow documentation. So MLflow is basically, has basically four critical components. So it is not like SageMaker or, or, or a offering that has like everything that you, that, that you need but it's a set of standards, a set of technologies that can use and tweak your project accordingly and use. And let's say, if you already have a lot of code uh, like from different systems, it might be hard to integrate an offflow. It's, I, in my experience, it's a good system for greenfield projects, like to start from scratch and 
use principles and standards. So that's how I see MLflow and how I like to introduce MLflow. So the, the first component is a component called MLflow tracking that allows you to record and query uh, experiment data. So it's called data, uh, even configuration and metrics as well. So this data is stored in like the, the framework is um, flexible. So like it has obviously a metric store that you can choose, like it can be in a relational database and there are integrations with uh, other tools like Dynamo, uh, like happening now. And um, you have like an artifact store where you store like artifacts, like uh, objects, blobs, uh, your models. And this is the MLflow tracking uh, component. And the second pillar of MLflow is actually more of like the MLflow project, it's a standard. So it's basically like, how do you package uh, data science code, like in a format that you can reproduce and run in any platform. So that is like the goal. If you, one way to look at MLflow and from like a, a, a guy called Jules Denji that was very big on the, so big on the ML space, is that like ML projects are like a bit of like Docker for data science, but what Docker did for software engineering projects, ML for projects to do for, for like data science projects. And I'll show you guys an example now. ML flow models is one thing this project, your project, your code that needs to run on the platform, ML for more abstraction to the models. Basically, if you have an ML flow model, the idea is that like if any company or any provider like implements the interface of ML, MLflow models, uh, it can run your models and on, on, on that platform. That's the reason why you can actually integrate any MLflow compatible or native model with a lot of the cloud providers. Uh, and you also have something called model registry. It's basically a, a store where you can annotate Many models and organizations send repository, and you can manage the life cycle of model of the model. Um, so let's start. So I hope saying it is unstable, but everything is okay at this stage. So um, introducing MLflow, how to use it. So I'll just give a, a simple example. So you have like the toy problem, um, toy problem uh, with uh, sklearn, uh, import data sets, you do train test split and you, <laughs> you get some set. Sorry. Um, and uh, can you hear me? Oh, I'm talking to myself. Uh, you're, you're fine. Very okay, cool, great, thanks. So, uh, and yeah, this is how would you run a logistic regression like when that, this is like, I'm not a data scientist. So let's think of it as like from a, a data engineer or machine learning engineer perspective, or data engineer perspective. Uh, so yeah, so you do like logistic regression, you classify fit and you have flow here. So if you want to give support to ML flow, you will just have to add uh, I think like these two lines, like uh, MLflow escalate on auto log and MLflow start run. And automatically, like a lot of things are unlocked to you. So you can start, uh, so your information will be logged. Like if you didn't configure anything, if you run this, it will be logged locally uh, in any like file system most likely. And uh, you unlock all the possibilities that MLflow can give for the native models that you're implementing, for instance, metrics, uh, like default, like confusion matrix for like, let's say binary classifier and things like that. And you don't need to do anything and I'll show you how to do that. And it's just like basically for free, freebies. And the MLflow tracking can look like, so this is your run, this is your model, this are your metrics. And you can just like manage and a lot of data scientists in the company can actually log these metrics. Um, so I'll just write you guys on my machine, but if you want to run on your side, feel free. I can potentially even copy these commands if you... So anyway, to, to the...
Man, you're having us write yeah, code so if you... during your talk. <laughs> yeah yeah so and let's see if it works because like um yeah so pip install like i've already installed my machine so let's get this repo in github uh i have the repo open here uh so please don't look at the modeling component a lot <laughs> like the model is like a, a, like illustration but this is like a structure of an ml flow project uh, so basically the most important files apart from like the rest is like regular code. So the most important file is what is called ML project. So the ML project is what defines is like the Docker file of the ML project. So you specify the name, you specify the type of dependency management. So you have three options at this. Uh, I don't know if they launch the new but it should be like, you can have Docker images or you can have Conda or you can use the system, file system. So the file system is still important. If you, let's say you have like a big machine that already has everything you need in there and need uh, like, and you don't want to use like any of these dependency managers like Conda or Docker, that should be fine. And then you have like entry points is like, like what are the different uh, components of your system? You can parameterize, you can put uh, parameters in here so it would help you on the deployment process. So I'll have to address on the, like a lot about deployment processes or operations in itself. So these are basically entry points. Like what is point here is main, start with the main and some part you can have some parameters here and what's the command that really needs to run so if you look it looks like a bit like docker billing as well i think was the initial like the concept like we want to organize data science projects and mainly machine learning projects so we like so basically with that standard you can easily productionize in, in different systems and let's say here we have train, we train a model, we evaluate model, and we register a model on the model registry. And I can just run quickly through the code. There's nothing special in here. So just like click, uh, yeah, click operation, and you run, train, evaluate, and it might register your model. But I have, um, what is this model training? Part. That's sorry, what, sorry. What's this model trying to do? Oh, that's a good point. So uh, it's the same problem that I mentioned before. So it's just like basically trying to predict uh, like a set of zero and ones, and then there's a prediction here around like a binary classifier. So the original data was actually kind of like time series for Bitcoin data, but like the topic of the book is trying to predict the price of Bitcoin based on uh, data sets from different days, but this doesn't work. So, so it's just a problem and this is like it. Okay. Cool. Uh, and this is the training data. Cool. Uh, yeah, so and you can look at the model, train model. So that's a supply split. Uh, there's an XGBoost. So XGBoost is one of the types of models that is supported by MLflow and you can run an auto log. And this is all vanilla. You train your data, you test data, you predict, and that's it. And you save your results. So this is just an example. So that where I want to show some of the capabilities of producibility. So one cool thing that you can do, like, so this is in GitHub, you want to share with someone what you do like so you just execute the commands that i showed you guys just in a bit uh sorry can you see can you still see my screen yes yeah yeah uh this this repo is private um so you'll have to make it public at the end of the talk or something oh really okay okay i'll do that <laughs> sorry uh cool so we can now uh, let me just remove the one that I already had here. Uh, you, you, uh, you can now run. Uh, uh, 
Let me just go back to the command because I forgot about the command. Um, can you go here? Yep. Just run straight from here uh, this file and it will just go automatically to GitHub. MFL is already installed in my machine, but imagine that I just had access to this GitHub. So it's doing, it's getting everything, it's creating like a environment, it's running, it did run, it just generated the training training file and that's it and generated the model. So, uh, and basically it ran everything, it just uh, uh, was, on a temporary file, the execution. Uh, and uh, yeah, and you can see the execution here. Uh, and you can now, uh, let me just go for the UI. Yeah, and you can now run, uh, let me just confirm, hope that this will run. Okay, so this is basically now you can run. You, you you might not have had any contact with the person that developed the initial model, but you have you can run in the machine without like knowing any details, and because the format is interoperable, so you can get executing and see what it did, and have like all the metrics that you generated and uh, things like that. Cool. So this is. Uh, like explaining a bit uh, the models and the, uh, for instance on this, this execute XG boost model fixed and I have the more this is exactly the force uh, in this case, like a tubus and uh, the M of one and and yeah, that's this is just to show like how easy is to start, get started with ML flow. And so, yeah, so this is how it looks. This is your local, but we, we need to, to, to discuss like, uh, like uh, uh, next steps, obviously. Uh, window, let, let me go to the slides and let's carry on yeah, to this with the slides. Cool. That's great. So this is what I kind of explained. So you have this concept of flavors and you have models coming uh, in different formats. And basically you can have flavors of these models. So there's something called PyFunk. So it basically makes uh, MLflow uh, like know how to run uh, like or deploy in different environments. You can deploy in uh, like on Spark or on SageMaker, Kubernetes, uh, and Azure ML as well. And obviously Docker, if you use the PyFunk uh, model or like the native models on MLflow. So it's just a way to, like, I don't think that this tool is magic. It's just like a way to standardize and organize how uh, data science and model packaging happens at the company. Like, I don't think that it saves work in the short term, probably it's more work, but it does wonders in a longer term and it takes time to, 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 to have the return of investment and it all, it's all dependent on your, on your specific situation. Like you shouldn't take a prescription for everything. Like if there's something interesting on MLflow, use it. And this is for instance, like uh, the model registry. So you can have multiple models and actually select like what goes into staging and production. And you can link this component uh, through the API I've not dealt a lot with this with, with this component, but like the idea of this components is that like you can then trigger like your CI CD systems based on this. So the different scientists can look at those metrics and like make a decision to move things to production. And from there, uh, you can uh, like CI CD 
your model. So it's just like organized. You don't need to think on this system. So oh, how will deploy? MLflow is giving you like a standard and it's a standard that's kind of like, like it's becoming slowly like a like a like a, an accepted standard in in a lot of companies. Yeah, cool. But the reasoning for that is because, like as you know, like because like MLflow started as a response to the big machine learning platforms like the famous Michelangelo and what are the other ones? <laughs> uh, yeah, from the other companies from Google and like because like only big companies could do machine learning. So what Databricks tried to do with them on Flow is like, let's open up this opportunity to do a machine learning properly, like to the open source community. And obviously like with like standards and trying to, because it's like, as you, as you know, and you have seen, like, it's like, it's not, it's like, it's, it's not straightforward how you productionize models and how you unlock value uh, in machine learning. So one of the components that um, I had discussed here is just like this general diagram of like uh, a machine learning engineering platform and uh, where we can see uh, uh, MLflow being useful. So this is like kind of like a common sense diagram. There's no magic in here. Uh, so basically you have this concept of data science workbench so it's basically your local environment where you kind of like engineer the environment so your data scientists can be productive. So I've seen this being very successful in, in previous companies that I worked on and like current companies as well. Like, so you as a data scientist, day one, you're not creative. You have a data science workbench. This workbench has the basics, like all your main dependencies, credential access to data sets. Um, and um, yeah, credential is, is definitely a, a, a barrier. And uh, like, yeah, the, 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 the vetted libraries in the company. And then from there, you can kind of, you have some kind of a control panel. So you can execute training locally or you can offload to remote environments like to Spark or to H2O or to other systems. And from there, like obviously still from your own console, uh, either by CICD mechanisms or semi-manual, you register your model in a centralized model registry accessible to your immediate organization where people can look at the metrics and at the same time, uh, uh, like, yeah, whenever you're happy, when you, you share and you just put met, push metrics around your model and annotations as well. And uh, this is like, let's say in some way, the start like the end of the training process, like the, 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 the outcome of the modeling process. It's a model in a format that's, uh, that is basically um, interoperable with the rest of the organization. So in that way, like you have economies of scale. So it means that you can have other teams dedicating to each of these components and you can start having specialists, let's say on modeling, specialists on like setting up training environments for GPUs, or for like tabular data or for time series and things like that. And, uh, and you start like gaining time. So if you want to model, you know that you need to go to this place. If you want to take care of data, there is also like a feature store and data layer. So luckily we will have like, I think the next presenter will be the very famous Willem Pinar, the creator of Feast, uh, the, the, one of the most famous uh, uh, feature stores. So where you just centralize and abstract in some way all your data engineering process on, on features and you can manipulate these features from your data science workbench. And also like obviously the monitoring and metrics component is also very important and it's central to everything that you do. And you obviously have like your inference and deployment environments that are connected to the model registry let's say this workbench does not talk directly with this because this is automated and this speaks from the model registry for vetted models. And this can be triggered with multiple te techniques. Uh, and obviously you have, we always have a production system that rates your prediction. So this is the high level machine learning engineering. Can MLflow do everything? No way. So like, it just helps parts of this process. So going a bit on this, 
So yeah, you can have like uh, ML flow on your workbench. So you can use the vetted models of your company or the models that are available with ML flow. You can log metrics uh, to ML flow, obviously to your, let's call it training environment. And you can have like a metric solution, a monitoring and metric solutions that evolve in some way, ML flow as well. And you have like model registry, ML flow is a good candidate, but you might need, you, 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 you might need specialized tools as well. Feature data layer, I don't think that ML flow is uh, like uh, geared to this at this moment. So you might be uh, like in a better position if you use something like Tekton or like Feast. And uh, production systems front end is questionable. So in the same way that we generated the training job, so MLflow has an ability to provide you with an API. So a local API based on Guernicon that you can have like kind of for free because this format is like the models are in a format that MLflow understands, it can actually set up an API automatically, Python-based API that you can deploy for your initial uh, like prototyping process. Uh, yeah, so this is more or less at a high level like the flow of a machine learning engineering platform. And ML flow is like a, like it's a slice of it. So there are other uh, platforms that are extremely important. And I'll address a couple of scenarios uh, and I'll put, I'll pull in some, 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 some tools and platforms that I found interesting during uh, the process of like, uh, like reasoning and tinkering about how to use uh, ML flow. Uh, questions so far? Uh, nothing on the channel so far. Okay, cool. Is this image clear? Oh, well, it's clear when I build it. <laughs> <laughs> okay, cool. Thank you. So this is your data science workbench. So this is like high level abstract. So you have tools, frameworks, you have access to data, you can do model management. Uh, and you can do dependency management, you can do deployment, you can do experimentation management. So like, yeah, the uh, ML flow can help you on uh, model management, experimentation management, and dependency management if you decide, but like depending on the company, you can force everyone to deploy ML flow models. You can extract the models because it's an open protocol. And obviously deployment, mm, it's not clear that ML flow can do deployments, but it can as well. So, and you can deploy to AWS directly to SageMaker or to any of these tools. And that's one, like one, one, one slice of things that like companies can use to get started easily on their projects as well. So a very simple workbench would be JupyterLab, MLflow and PostgreSQL. So you need PostgreSQL because plain MLflow does not support like the model for the model registry you need uh, you need a post, like you need a database, like it doesn't need to be PostgreSQL, it can be many things. And these days, I think there's a provider that allows it to be in Dynamo. So you kind of can have like your ML flow system kind of running completely like serverless in some way, because you can have like uh, ML flow, like API at API level running on, 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 on Lambdas, and you can have like, uh, let's say Aurora uh, PostgreSQL databases or Dynamo databases completely serverless and setting up all this environment, but you can't get around from like building proper images with Jupyter that like are needed with kernels that are needed for your different uh, data scientists are um, Python most likely are the most common. And obviously generally this Jupyter environment would should have access to your like, let's say to your direct access to your big, big data tools in the case that you are in this environment. So let's say uh, training with ML flow, what you can do with ML flow on the training process. So you can use uh, ML flow in some way as an orchestrator and use the ML project abstraction where you just like use, yep. Uh, like you, you can use different steps. Uh, like let's say this is like an ML project, like similar to what I said. So you have like a input data file and you have a training model, a train model step, and you have an evaluate model step and a register model step. And then from there, uh, you can produce like a Docker image that does like all of this in like a, 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 a sensible way and, and deploy and registers your model in the end in the, um, 
in the in the in in, in the model registry. And do I do more things here? I can evaluate the model. Yeah, so this is just like generating metrics for your models. So that's cool. And then you have your model registry and the beautiful thing of like having this in MLflow is that you don't need to write code to, de to deploy it into an API or to batch scoring. And this is the, the, an example of how to register a model with MLflow. Let me see if I have an example here so I can quickly show. Uh, yeah, uh, I'll show. I'll show later on, like after I close this window. Uh, cool. So you register a model just by selecting the model, like on that interface that we selected, and you you can register your model. And this is, for instance, like how can you implement the like a, a, a model management life cycle? So. Your model goes from development, staging, production, and archive. Uh, so MLflow has staging, production, and archive, and you can link these transitions with your CI/CD tool. So, and but you need to do also permission management. So this is like one of the weaknesses that I'll point out of of MLflow. So in a lot of regulated environments, you actually need authorization and uh, authentication and authorization. So authentication is easy to add to MLflow because it's, it's not contained. You can put a proxy on top of it and link with your, like, let's say IT security mechanism. But now authorization is a bit more tricky if you want to segregate uh, for different, is, is there a question? Very good. Uh, can we use Spark notebooks or another? When yeah, 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 yeah. You can use PySpark on, yeah, you can use PySpark on Jupyter. Yeah, you can use what you want because like this Jupyter component is just an example of a workbench. So a lot of the teams that I work with, they use PySpark. So in there and it works well. And it can be Zeppelin as well. So it's actually not very important as long as the libraries are in there and the environment is, is controlled. Oh, all the I remember <laughs> how's that <laughs> back from Mozambique. Um, cool. So let's go. And as I said, you can set up an API easily and you can deploy also to SageMaker just by running a command, like this one command before that you need to do. But basically the model that was this available on, on the model registry, as long as it's like one of the many native formats, you can deploy directly to SageMaker and use SageMaker. And if you want to move it to Azure ML, you can do the same thing. So that's like a beauty of MLflow as well in some way. Uh, for feature and data management, this is like a bit stretching the goal, but I needed to do it just to stretch MLflow as maximum as possible, but I'm not sure if it's the ideal tool for all the scenarios. So you can actually create like, let's say a workflow in MLflow. So you package your project and you put in a tool like Airflow for instance, and let's say, so you can just like centralize all the metrics that you need. So you load raw, you load raw data, you check verified data and you feature set uh, generate. So, so this is like a multi-step workflow in MLflow that allows you to do that. So for in each of the cases you would it's not exactly multi-step, but should be like, uh, like yeah, uh, um, close enough. So you, you have one, one step and if any of the steps fails, you, you, you have like, it, it'll just mark as failed, but you can run it obviously in another tool. You can run it in like Airflow can be the orchestrator and will communicate with MLflow just for the metrics. So you have everything centralized and you, if you want to see more detailed metrics and artifacts of the run, you can just like have it here and you can even comment in here. Uh, for instance, like things that we can do and their examples here is uh, a check and verify data. For instance, this is the repo of the book is open. You don't need to provide the book to use it. Uh, but yeah, uh, yeah. So you can use like a tool like great, great expectations and do assertions uh, with uh, great expectations. And this would be part of your MLflow process. So if your workflow fails at that point, everything will fail. 
as long as one of these assertions fails. And you can use the data on the file system or let's say data on S3. You can do like steps on S3, like so you have row staging and then like the prediction data as well, okay? And yeah, and you can also describe that. What did I use for description here? Uh, so yeah, there's this tool called like uh, Pandas, uh, Pandas Profiling that allows you to describe. So you can get distributions of your metrics, what is quite cool. So account, mean metric, and things like that. And yeah, and this is another tool uh, that I like a lot. It's called Evidently, and it, that you can actually just like, let's say, um, attach the reports of Evidently. Evidently does like deeper, uh, like statistical tests on distributions of like incoming data, like comparing reference data set with your latest input data set, and it calculates uh, the drift uh, for you. And it has some limitations because like the, the JSON is a bit weird, but you can save the, the report and I'll show you the report just now on MLflow. So it's everything within the same environment and you can monitor like, oh, what happened to this training job that happened like last week and this is the drift. And, and because you are on the same interface, you can actually make a decision over this model. Oh, does it move from staging to production? Is that too much drift? or there is no drift. And this is kind of the reports that you can have. You can have this data in JSON to automate more and make your decisions. But the, data, the JSON that they're doing, they're at least on this version that I'm, I'm using, I'm just very unhappy. It sounds like a hack. It does the job. So if you really want to see what is the drift and what are the p-values, or whether like the drift was detected, you can use it and trigger your automated systems to either like, let's say, move this model to the next stage or deploy into production. And yeah, another cool tool that I don't know if you guys are familiar, but probably a lot of people are already familiar, but I like a lot, is called PyCarrot. So PyCarrot has like a direct integration uh, with MLflow and you can actually just run like a bit like you can do with uh, tools like H2O, AutoML with like, it tests multiple models, but it just like has beautiful metrics. And so it's just a great starting point uh, if you're starting yeah, to just model a problem just to give you some hints and directions. And it's just like, uh, yeah, so I, have, like, I had like a credit card data set in here. I can do PyCarrot anomaly detection and uh, it will run like multiple algorithms around uh, anomaly detection. And I don't need to do anything. So it's already logs natively to MLflow and I can um, look at the different metrics and actually make a decision uh, over them. So let me just show you like yeah, one extra thing that I wanted to show you and can do it now. So this is like, for instance, um, MLflow. Uh, yeah, so this is an example of like, let's say upper parameter optimization. Um, of one of the models, for instance. And you can see what you can see in here. Yeah, you can see, let's say multiple executions, but this doesn't have what I wanted to show. Okay. Okay, I think I upgraded the version of MLflow. Okay, but that's great, okay. So for instance, like this is comparing, like, so I was doing upper parameter optimization in that same data, toy data set, but you can actually check everything on the same place and look at the metrics. And let's say, do I have an F1 here? Yeah, uh, yeah, so you can decide that like, let's say training accuracy score What's the highest one? Okay, oh, I like this guy. Okay, that's fine. Where is the model? Okay, fantastic. I want this model. I didn't look at it and I can put some notes. I think this model is pretty cool. So this is obviously installed in your centralized system and your data scientists have access to it. 
And yeah, and yeah, I want this guy going into production and being registered. Uh, it's, it's a production model. Yes, I want to register it. And you can go to your workflow. And you can decide on into stage or it needs to go into production. Yes, whatever is in production goes to archive. Although this is metadata, this can drive a lot of use cases. Uh, like, yeah, uh, in the in the other, like uh, upstream. Uh, is there questions? Yeah, that's cool. So we still have time. So the other cool thing that you can have that the models uh, give you for free in MLflow is this thing called a schema verification. If you use MLflow for inference, so you can verify the schemas of your model because like generally, like depending on the type of the model, like you can know what types of data, what are your inputs. So it will just like just uh, throw an exception if you call the API with the wrong format and it won't execute. So that's a cool thing. So basically what they're trying to say here is that like we need to stop developing APIs for every model. So we need to create platforms to leverage like, uh, like the, the power of data science because we actually need to experiment a lot and uh, do less engineering. Cool. So for me, the number one strength is standardization. So I think a lot of <laughs> like, I've seen Viche, like your know, whole team, missing you guys a lot. But, and I, we've been on this journey with like a lot of, like with a lot of you guys that are on this call. It's just like, this problem looks so hard in multiple companies. It's always different and things like that. What I like of MLflow is this, like at least the aim to standardize things and probably we, we might move faster on the direction. I'm not sure if it's the right direction, but this aim to standardize, I think it's, 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 a, good, it's a good approach and help us think about things. Like let's not use it blindly, but the idea of standardization of, you, of thinking about like this problem's hard and before like choosing different components, this is what I appreciate on MLflow. And the second thing is reproducibility. So for me, this is like a game changer, like in the sense of, like you have this, there's now a Docker format for data science projects. That's quite interesting. And they're not the only team, the only project doing that. They're like all your cadres are very similar and everyone, this is a community. So it imitates each other project, each, each of the projects. And uh, in this idea of leveraging off the shelf tested components, if you look at MLflow, there's actually not a lot in there. It's basically stitching best practice. They use Conda, they use, um, uh, Docker, they use everything that's best practice, TensorFlow, there's no, like, they are opinionated, but they try to minim minimize the opinion, the, the opinion. And this sounds like good and healthy for me. And REST, REST APIs, this is also like a number one thing for like, if we want to use it more and do up with it. And what I really enjoyed also is the, but it's like, it's actually a thought. It's not like I'm amazed with it. Because I know that in the end it might not work well as the as the as, as on the toy examples is the integration like the fact that you can actually have one like, um, have your data scientist model the thing and deploy into whatever is the cloud that is accessible to you or accessible to the location where you are or you can go on premise but this is completely kind of like abstracted away from you. Like even if it doesn't work well, just the idea sounds like the correct thing on the right direction that you can put the right resources, your software engineering team at looking at this. I think they don't need to reinvent the concept. And for me, that's where the power of like MLflow comes in. But again, MLflow is not the only tool that does that. Like there are a couple of other tools that do that. And also great open source community. So I started, I tried in the beginning of the book to contribute a bit and like they are like, always willing to help. I still have an open issue for a while because I got bored with the task, but they were very open. The developers are very open and they are keen to have like contributors. And I highly recommend because this is like straightforward Python. Like that's, that was one of the boring things as well. I was like hoping to see like amazing things, but it's just like good old Python orchestration and uh, nothing else. So limitations a lot. Uh, the most important one for me is now like in regulated environments and because of, because particularly machine learning is in a lot of areas like being FinTech, 
dealing with data from users, like it's considered an extension of data now. Uh, so it's enterprise security. That is a big barrier of option. So integrate your LDAP systems, Okta systems, and things like that. So authentication, you can easily solve by putting a proxy or something like that. But the big problem is authorization. How do you segregate different users from a specific team of the organization? You can get authorization, but I think like, uh, sorry, you can get authentication, or like, yeah, username, password, and things like that. But each, this user is allowed to do X, Y, Z on this particular model. Generally, this is either you pay the enterprise version or you use an enterprise offering of ML flow or have to code it by yourself, or you have to segregate different ML flows in the company. And this is where a lot of companies are doing. Because we, we have meetings these days, that you can create a chart and deploy for your company in a way to work. And this is like a, a workaround. The other thing that I address on the book is this plugin mechanism. Like it's a cool idea that is that you can actually hook things in any places on ML flow, like through the API to the clients and things like that. So, and you can easily create a plugin. So sorry. No, Hello? Right. Well, we lost your sound for a bit. It's back. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's so much easier when there is actually a repo to show examples. <laughs> this is done long ago. So I've created a plugin here. I don't recall what this plugin does, but basically the plugin is where a potential you might be interested in this because this is where you can create a new type of deployments and you can just interact a bit more flow. So deployment client, and you can override some of their, the, the classes and access the objects directly in Python. So this is straight Python, there is no magic. So this is like, I think I created a deployment mechanism inside ML flow to deploy things, I think on my local. Yeah, that was basically it. So you can like, this is one of the, I, I'm not sure if it's, there's not a lot of things documented I needed to go to the book. And in order to implement it, you basically have to patch your version of ML flow and then it becomes your ML flow. And the old story is what just like merging with master become like a problem, but it's straightforward to like a toy plugin for ML flow. And then like, yeah, it's a way to have a hipster ML flow version. So it's branded just for you. So you just need to create the plugin and there's like you need to patch it into the, uh, yeah, into ML flow. But this is on the book as well, like how to create plugins. Uh, uh, yeah, few vendors with managed services, it starts to appearing. It's not Airflow for instance, where all vendors have the version or elastic search. So there are some independent ven vendors coming. I'm not sure if, obviously there's Databricks, the creators where you can have access to this on the major clouds, but there are not a lot of independent vendors. So this is something to watch out and I'm putting the limitation as it's like, yeah, you might be locked in into Databricks if you want to use them, but the tool works without Databricks and you, it's open source. And it's it's like data, Databricks created Spark. Spark is fair open source. You don't need to buy Spark to use Spark properly. So that's why I also believe in ML fluid. And yeah, the big thing is not the solution to all the ML engineering problems but can be not even the pillar, but can be a good tool to help you out on a, a couple of things. And this addresses like, um, I think at this day and age, it should have like built in a CD for ML uh, support, uh, continuous delivery for machine learning. It's quite basic and they have everything to support it natively in my opinion, and they should explore that space. Um, so these are the ML flow limitations. And I also wanted to address a bit and doing some outreach for PACT. So the organization that I wrote this book for, so they are keen to receive proposals. You can go to the PACT site and they receive proposals on books and ideas that they have in concept. And they help you out, like obviously on the process of writing the book. And yeah, and yeah, my experience of writing for PACT, this was like very painful, particularly on the hard moments, but this is, was just like on the initial months because I was, 
I did it like during lockdown. So it was not hard lockdown. It's not as hard. So I actually had plenty of free time. So, <laughs> and was just like obsessed with technology. It was quite cool. So, but yes, the hard part is just um, like, like getting feedback from reviewers. Some feedback can be very mean and um, affect your, your <laughs> like say your self-belief. Like in some people, like some of these, of these reviewers are, um, let's say, not mean, but yeah, it's not good. Um, cool. And then, yeah, and the coolest thing was that like, for a niece that I think, I think Nicholas was the one who told me that he just bought the book and I just looked and it was number one release in artificial intelligence for a while, uh, but not any longer, but this is the print screen for life for me. And like, I don't know what it means, but it sounds cool. And uh, yeah, now it's just like down there, like because things. Uh, cool, yeah, that's mainly it. Uh, yeah, questions, open discussion. And thanks for attending.